Joining me now is somebody much smarter, uh, Stephen Lester, uh, who's kind of been a go-to expert uh, in the weeks after this uh, horrible uh, derailment, uh, controlled burn uh, that they're calling it. You're with the Center uh, for uh, Center for Health, Environment, and Justice. You're the science director there, and you've been studying this uh, and other toxins for a long, long time. My uh, Lewis, who was on the ground for us, spoke with you last week after the community meeting where you spoke about um, dioxins, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, are a very dangerous uh, toxin that is formed from the combustion of vinyl chloride, which was the main chemical on that train. And uh, when you spoke last week at the community meeting, uh, the, at that point, the EPA was not testing for it. Uh, and now the EPA has announced they are testing for it, but the catch is Norfolk Southern, the train company, is going to be doing the testing. And EPA says they'll be overseeing it, which I, for one, think is very backwards. But let's just start for uh, those who don't know. Can you kind of explain uh, why you were concerned that they were not testing for dioxin and uh, what exactly is the threat uh, of dioxin in the air, water and soil? Um, we've done a lot of work with dioxins over the years. It, it is a very toxic substance, often considered one of the most toxic chemicals ever tested. It was. It is not. It, it is a. It is not found. It is not generated or made by anything. It's not a product. It's a byproduct of a variety of different kinds of industrial processes that involve chlorine. Uh, there, there, there is one, there are probably 25 or 30, there's 75 total dioxins in the, in the, that exist, but only typically 17 of them are analyzed for when we look in the environment. Um, the thing that worries me the most about dioxin is, and in a situation like this, is that when you have five tanker, tanker trucks of dioxins that were dumped and burned, that it's going to create these dioxins. Um, it's in the exact um, dioxins are formed in burning when on the on the surface of particulate matter. So all this that black smoke that people saw and all those images that were shown when they were burning this stuff, that black smoke was a perfect furnace and place for dioxins to form. And so um, I'm very worried that. They, the dioxins were in that cloud, that they settled on people's property in some distance away. And people as much as 15 miles away at the meeting that I attended last week talked about ashes from the, the, the fire landing on their property. So it can travel quite some distance, which is, which is what we understand typically from dioxin, is that it does travel long distances. There are people up in the Arctic and and, and uh, that uh, have nowhere near any sources of dioxin that have dioxin in their bodies. Uh, and so it, it does move in the air. Um, I wanna also ask you just the EPA, their given reason for why they were testing for this is they said it's kind of just, you know, in, in the environment anyways, and there's no baseline for it. They said, we don't have a baseline for what the levels in East Palestine were before. So the testing would kind of not be uh, accurate or, or useful. I didn't really understand that because whether you have a baseline for what it was before, the EPA does have allowable limits for most chemicals and toxins. So you would be able to test to see, are the levels now higher than your allowable limit. That, that's right. I mean, that that statement made absolutely no sense. It was an attempt, I think, to just divert from what they need to do, which was to test for dioxins. Um, they, if they analyze for it, I'm certain they will find it. And if the levels are high, they will understand that. I mean, the EPA spent close to 30 years analyzing and looking at dioxins. There's a long history in the agency of looking at and researching the risks of this chemical. This is not a new chemical. It's not something that nobody's heard about. Maybe the public hasn't heard about it. That's possible. But researchers, scientists, toxicologists, EPA as an institution is very well familiar with this. So to say something like that is is not at all sensible. Um, 
and it makes no sense. Uh, there's plenty, as you said, of standards and guidelines and processes for figuring out if this level is high or if it's not, or if it's typical of what we find in the environment. So um, it's a good thing now that EPA has acknowledged that they will do some testing for dioxin, but this next step is raises just a whole host of new questions because the company is being required to do it. It's not going to be done by the agencies, although there's some questions about who's going to actually do this testing, um, at least that I've, I'm not, that I've heard. So I'm very concerned that the company that's responsible for this accident is being asked to do the testing. Um, if they were interested in doing, if they were interested in doing this kind of testing, initially they would have done it when they did the test burn. That's the time to test in the air. It's remarkable to me as a public health scientist that people could have sat around on that um, to try to uh, figure out what to do with that those burning. Dis, dislodged uh, tanker trucks, and there wasn't a public health scientist there saying, okay, if we're going to have to burn it, and, and there's a long history of burning these chlorinated chemicals, creating dioxins, it's one of the most toxic chemicals ever tested, we need to do some testing of the air and monitor the air while we do the burn. We need to know so that we can tell people what their what risks they face. Uh, clearly, there was nobody like that in, the, in that group. And I know you I know you're not like a government official, but I'm like a, from a common sense perspective, wouldn't you want to keep people evacuated in, until you do some thorough testing for this, particularly the people next to the creeks, uh, people right in the blast zone? I mean, you saw that mushroom cloud. Does anybody think it stopped at the one mile city limits? Um, it, it does. I mean, obviously, a lot of people think that they brought folks back because the, the company could not move the train if the city, if the town was evacuated. Mm -hmm. It's just mind boggling to me that 4,500 people were not kept away uh, until you did some uh, preliminary testing, not just for dioxins, but yeah. for everything. Right, right. Dioxin is one chemical. It's, you're exactly right. There are a lot of chemicals that people are being exposed to there. Um, I, I, you know, I've, I've had some experience with the crises before because I worked at Love Canal. I was brought in as a, as a science advisor to the residents who lived at Love Canal. That's more than 40 years ago. And in that crisis, people were like they are here, raising all kinds of questions because they've been exposed to the chemicals. That was a landfill and the landfill did two things to spread into the community. One, it uh, traveled underground and seeped into people's basements. And also it came to the surface and people were breathing the chemicals from the air. And so at that time, there was very little experience for the government and the, and the public agencies to try to figure out how to do this. Uh, but today, 40 years later, we have a great deal more understanding about chemicals and exposures and, and ways to respond to things like ex community exposures like this. But none of that seems to be happening here. None of that experience has been transferred. None of that understanding of how to respond is has, has made it to East Palestine yet. Uh, it's remarkable to me that um, I was there last week for a couple of days and I'm seeing these workers all around the town cleaning up the creek and cleaning up this. And, and um, as was mentioned in the earlier piece that the workers aren't wearing any kind of protective gear. I mean, just aside from what the community, the people living there are experiencing, the guy is cleaning up and providing this these these remedial measures. I mean, they were aerating the water. There's an awful lot of soluble toxic chemicals, water soluble chemicals that got into the water, and they're aerating them to re to eliminate them from the water. And what they're doing is putting it into the air. And if you go to anywhere near those aerators, you can smell those chemicals. I actually saw media interviewing people in front of the creek down there, uh, and you could smell the chemicals. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with you people? Why? How can we you? Got, we got video. Uh, a couple residents and uh, a resident from Flint went down there to take soil samples and water samples, mm -hmm. and they were noticeably getting more. Uh, I guess they called it like loopy and almost like the feeling that you're under the influence of something. Right, right. Well, that's what these all of these chemicals, these volatile chemicals affect the central nervous system. So that is not surprising. Uh, 
But, you know, I was talking to one of the local leaders in the community and, and she told me that, you know, these creeks that run through the town, many of them are, go under the buildings. I mean, the, the one goes right under City Hall and she was telling me that she was there that the day before and she could smell the chemicals in City Hall. And, you know, and the, these creeks also run under the high school. And it's like, you have to wonder, like, what are the kids in the, going to the high school? What are they being exposed to? What are the workers and being exposed to? What are the people working in the city hall being exposed to? And that's the problem with all of these questions that people are asking. Very, very important and reasonable questions. What can I grow? Can I, you know, is my, my, can I do my crop this year? These are farmers and they want to know whether their car, their crops are going to can be contaminated with chemicals. And, you know, can I get kids play in the yard? Reasonable and important questions. And it's hard to answer those questions, except in a very precautionary way, uh, without information on, on the chemicals in the soil. And, you know, I mean, that EPA is going to do testing now, I think is good, but there's a lot of questions about, I mean, I think that the EPA should require this company to create a sampling plan. If they're going to do sampling, they need to create a sampling plan that they make available to the public so people can review it and understand it and change it, perhaps, if it's not going to be addressing the questions they're asking. Uh, so they, they have to have a sampling plan that's transparent and clear where they what they're going to sample for. And I mean that first in terms of are they going to sample the air? Are they going to sample the surface soil? Are they going to sample the sediment and the water? What are they going to sample? The next question would be, okay, um, how many samples are you going to take and from which medium? The third question would be, uh, where are you going to take these samples? What's the location? And the next question is, how are you going to take these samples? I mean, a soil sample is can be taken in a variety of ways. I mean, you can take a scoop and take a sliver and put it in a jar and call that a sample. That's called a... That's called a um, uh, I'm blanking on the word, but there's a term for it, uh, a, a, a scoop sample. And then you can take what's called a composite sample, where you identify a point and take five samples from like two feet away from that in five locations and combine them into a composite sample. Um, there's a lot. Of, and, and, and then there's the procedures of how you actually collect them, the samples. And then there's the analytical procedures. What are you going to look for? I mean, there's a standard test for dioxin, for example, of 17 different components in the mixture of dioxins. That's a standard. That's what I would expect them to do here. Anything less than that would not be appropriate. Well, uh, I, have, I have question number one, number two, number three, and number four. Why is the EPA having the company that caused this conducting the testing? I, I, I'm not asking you to get political, yes. but it, it's it's like police investigating themselves, the fox guarding the get. Uh, Fox guarding the hen house, they do not want to find levels of dioxin because they're already going to be facing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in a settlement. Uh, it just makes no sense. The federal government has money. Last time I checked, you had said originally that the EPA, you didn't think they wanted to test for this because they were likely going to find it. It's a long cleanup. You don't clean up dioxin right away uh, and it would cost a lot of money. Well, uh, that's right. I, I don't know why the company's being asked to do it. I'm really surprised that EPA is not taking this on themselves. They said that they were going to take the lead in doing the cleanup. But everything I'm seeing right now, since they've said that, it doesn't imply that anything different has changed. Anything has changed, that they're seemingly operating the same way with the company in charge. Um, I'm not happy that the company's put in charge of doing this testing. And uh, can I ask you, you're not, you're not a meteor meteorologist, but it doesn't take a rocket science to realize that the wind took that plume in many different directions. I mean, I've, I've spoken with people saying they have symptoms in western Pennsylvania, uh, 15 to 20 miles north, uh, west of East Palestine. I mean, people are talking about symptoms even in north northeastern states. Uh, you know, we can't directly, you know, say uh, it's connected, but a lot of the same symptoms, and we know that this did not stop at the city limits of East Palestine. Uh, not that you're not that you're a doctor or anything, but you know, to people who have been feeling some of these things, uh, sore throat, uh, you know, just not feeling themselves, uh, rashes. 
uh, in Pennsylvania, West Virginia. I've even uh, gotten messages from people in Virginia. Uh, how do you, I mean, can normal people, working people like test for dioxin? I assume it's expensive, not just dioxin, but w what should people do who feel that after this, uh, they're not feeling right themselves? Yeah, there's no easy test for dioxin. It's a pretty complicated chemical to analyze for, primarily because you have to have high resolution in your analytical equipment to get down to the levels where dioxin causes its adverse health effects. So it's not something the public can generally do. Um, I don't have a good answer for that, quite honestly, uh, because there's... Um, all we can really try to hope is that someone like the agency EPA will go out and do honest testing, clear testing uh, with the traditional methods, not some new approach that I understand that Norfolk Southern is proposing, some kind of fingerprint approach that they think will be able to identify whether the dioxin that's out in the environment was actually from their burn. Uh, th there's no experience with doing something like that. There is experience with looking at some fingerprints. Some researchers have looked for this for like pulp and paper mills uh, that have some pretty stable environments and um, a little bit with uh, wood, wood treatment plants. Uh, but that's never been an accepted approach for analyzing dioxin. There's a standard approach that everybody uses who look, who's concerned about dioxin, and that's to look for 17 isomers uh, of dioxin. That's what they should be doing here. This is no place to experiment with something new that at best is going to save the company a lot of money um, uh, by providing a shortcut to the cost of the testing. And worst, it's not going to give people information about what's in the, in the soil and where the places where they live. Right. And so I, I, I really hope that EPA will, you know, that someone's going to throw a bucket of cold water on them and they'll say, oh, yeah, it's, we were now, we, what are we doing here? And, and change their approach and really take this bull by the horns and do the proper testing and do it right and do it in places where people are uh, so that they can begin to understand the risk that they're facing. And last yeah. question, last question, uh, Colin, if you have the clip, uh, almost a month later, the EPA administrator, Michael Reagan, uh, felt it was now the time to advise children uh, not to play by the creeks, uh, if we could play that. For the time being, while the pollution is present, uh, as a father, I would not advise anybody, adult or child, to play the creeks and stream. What we've said is the drinking water has been tested. If that drinking water has been tested and a green light has been given, then we feel confident in that. But while we're cleaning up this disaster site, I would advise that anyone play in water that's contaminated or soil that's contaminated. This is an ongoing effort to as a, to efficiently and effectively clean up the mess that North and Southern caused. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. Sounds kind of crazy to me that this wasn't, there wasn't signs by the creek. There wasn't a guidance by the EPA not to play or it's not just children. People are jogging around this park. Uh, what are your thoughts on he's saying this a month later? Well, I think I think that it speaks to the fact that they've done enough. They're now beginning to understand what people are being exposed to. That's what drove that statement, that they had more information about the levels of the chemicals in the water. And they're recognizing that people shouldn't be playing there. And so he's doing the right thing. And if they continue to do proper testing, I think you're going to see more and more of those kind of statements coming out because they're going to continue to find it. And this is not even looking for dioxin. This is looking for other things. So um, I'm glad to hear that. It's late. People have been playing. Um, what they need again, I mean, I talked about a safety uh, uh, sampling plan for the new testing they're proposing, but they also need a safety plan for the cleanup that protects not just the workers, but the community. There hasn't been anything like that so far. I mean, your your first guest talked about how the workers are complaining of symptoms because they were out on the on that site cleaning up without any protective gear, and and I've seen that in in the guys working around the, the town and dealing with the, the contamination in the water. I mean, somebody has to take control of what's happening at that community, and the cleanup is is not being under any kind of control right now. And, and I, I, I feel for the workers who are the front line of, of what they're being exposed to. And I feel for the people who live there who are getting re-exposed in some cases because of not 
not anybody who understands what they're doing, but people not knowing what what's in the in the in the soil that they're handling and dealing with. It's 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 a mistake. What's what they're doing there? Absolutely. They, they, they got to do better. The people there deserve better. Thank you, uh, Stephen Lester, Science Director with the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice. Uh, also wrote uh, a piece about this, uh, particularly dioxins for the Guardian. Uh, so everybody check out uh, his piece uh, up on the Guardian. Uh, we'll definitely uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you for having me.